This episode is brought to you by Vital Farms. Isn't it bullshit to have to question where your food comes from? At Vital Farms, you can trace your pasture-raised eggs all the way back to the source, the pasture. On the side of each pasture-raised carton of eggs, you'll find the name of the farm where your eggs were laid. And when you look the farm up on their website, you'll get a peek at all the sunshine, fresh air, and open space the hens enjoy. Learn more and find out where to buy them at vitalfarms.com. Vital Farms, keeping it bullshit free. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I'm really excited about today's episode. We've got a fantastic fellow colleague and guest, David Pierce. He's a dentist and he's a coach. He's an entrepreneur. And we're going to talk all about business, increasing revenue, more time off. And I love talking with fellow healthcare professionals. And David, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Will. It's great to be on the show. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Uh, no, kind of tell your story and how you evolved into becoming an entrepreneur. Sure. Uh, well, maybe entrepreneur was in my blood. You know, at age 12, I had a little lawn mowing business uh, with my silent partner, my mother, who uh, you know, provided the, uh, the lawn mower and the gas and the transportation. Uh, and I did the marketing, which was the old age old get out on foot and knock on doors. Um, so that that was intriguing to me. Never really wanted to be an employee. So aside from summer jobs, uh, never have been an employee. Um, so uh, nothing about nothing wrong with being employees. You know, you gotta have employees. So that's great. Just wasn't my path. Uh, and then dentistry. I've, you know, I've always been uh, kind of a lifelong learner. I enjoy. I, I just enjoy the process of learning. So general dentist, but there's so many courses that allow you to move in different directions if you want to, and in, in, within the dental field. And so as I exposed myself to those more and more specialized type procedures, clinical, uh, my initial thought was you, get, you become a master of clinical procedures and then people will flock to you and the business side will take care of itself. Uh, I, I don't know, that. there's probably somebody out there who would, argue, who would argue that that's true, but I would say, no, that's not true for the huge vast majority, if not everybody. Uh, so at some point, having mastered those, I, I turned my attention to the business side and, and mostly to me. How do I make David a better version of David as a leader, uh, as an owner of a business? And then as those skills got better, the business got better and more patients said yes to more uh, life-changing dentistry, which is really what we're offering. And uh, when the team got more engaged and more on board and out of all that, the natural uh, side effect is uh, more revenue. So that's that's sort of the uh, that's sort of the path, and then I did that for being thirty eight years of growth. Those two decades were were painful at, at at the very least, you know, pretty pathetic as far as my personal growth. But you know, everybody has their own journey. Uh, and after thirty eight years of clinical, I sold that business, and then uh, the last eight years or so, I've done some dabbling, if you will, on uh, maybe coaching in a mastermind setting of other dentists on the business side. And then after I sold my practice, I focused. Um, my energy is solely on the coaching side. And wrote a couple of books first part of the issue, this year on that, um, on on money in general, uh, and money and wealth. Uh, and it's been a fun, yeah, it's been a fun journey. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And uh, what's interesting is a lot of um, you know, my physician colleagues, um, because physicians they're kind of bound to this uh, W two employment model where you have to get hired by a hospital or a practice and kind of dentists where they're more entrepreneurial because they can set up their practices and they they know about marketing and, you know, sales. And uh, so a lot of dentists are actually doing a lot better than in doctors, you know, financially, um, which is, uh, you know, we'll kind of talk about, so you talk about, um, you know, in your practice, you, uh, you talk about dramatically, drastically increased revenue with more time off. Right. How do you how do you do that? Right, you don't have <laughs> time to spend it. Right, I think that it's a you know that it's been proven through many many industries outside of dentistry that human production you know on, on a typical week that the end of day Thursday production is starting to drop and you might as well not even show up on Friday. <laughs> any small business you know that's working more than four days a week is really kind of kidding themselves as far as you know are they truly being productive? One. And then two, if you look at the people's schedules and you kind of go back through it and you say, okay, good. So, so you had this many hours of capacity if you were running a really well or a machine of that, how many of those hours did you actually utilize? And if it's not, you know, 100% all the time, then, then why are you even open if you can't fill it? Like, why, who are you kidding that you're going to fill it? Like, just condense it that way. Um, and then also the same psychologists that look at the week would say that, that, that human, 
I'm, I, I wouldn't be knowledgeable enough to say was it limited strictly to the United States because different cultures are different as to how they, they approach life and lifestyle. But in the United States, the idea of you know, these same studies that we talk about a four day, uh, you know, end of day, Thursday, Friday, and the productivity dropping. We also say it somewhere in, at the four, five, six week period that the human mind needs a break other than, uh, other than the weekend, which oftentimes isn't necessarily a break because it's so regimented with kids and activities. Um, so if, if you looked at that and said, well, you never should work more than 40 a week and every four to five weeks of work, you should close for something more than a weekend. Um, so even if you just follow that path, um, you're going to end up probably taking more than two, three, four weeks a year off. Uh, and so for us, we would take off 12 to 14 weeks a year, at least a week a month, just shut the office down completely. We, as we did more and more of that time off, our product, productivity, productivity, just numbers, became greater that grew so the dollars per hour of revenue grew um and and i don't really i don't think it's like magic you know, it's, there's a lot of science economic science behind why that works um, yeah yeah i love yeah. that uh because you know you're talking about scaling time and that's using systems and employees and um because a lot of doctors are so used to this um trading time for a money model where you're basically seeing patient, you know, basically for each patient or procedure or whatever you get paid, but you're talking about how you create systems and processes where people or software, um, AI, all do all of this. And then that frees up your time, um, which you talk about, we you know we're talking about how entrepreneurship, you can take much more time off while making more money. Talk about that. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, you know, the cliche is, you know, you, you take time off so you can work on the business, not in the business, you know. And so I have certainly always noticed that my very best thinking time has been uh, oftentimes initially be like accidental, you know, like I would go to a course, I'd have a, a very tight regimen scheduled at the course for learning, and then I'd get the very, very next plane, get home as fast as I could to wife and children in business. And then every once in a while, you know, those, those darn airlines, they'd screw up. And I'd have to spend the night in a hotel. Couldn't, you know, flight was canceled. And be like, oh, this is horrible. And then what I'd find is like, no, but like when I go to that site, but here's an opportunity to take all that information you have to process it through, how would I incorporate it, who would do what, really lay out a plan. So I went back to the office and said, here's the big picture, here's how this fits in the big picture, here's what everybody does, here's what I do, here's how we're going to roll it out slowly, here's what it's going to look like three months, six months, whatever. That that really was supposed to something when I started paying attention to that. It's like, you know, I I am very effective. And that, I, anybody would become much more effective if you get yourself in a different environment, your time is on your side, and you have time to actually think about what's going on in your office without anybody interrupting that. One, and then two, if you can have some other folks you can bounce ideas off of, uh, not necessarily a full-blown coach like I do, although I think that's the best scenario, but if you just have other folks that you admire. And you can reach out to once in a while and say, so like, how would you handle this? So in what circumstances would you do this? Da, da, da. Um, and they can just give you, you know, their shoot from the hip, hip comments. Uh, that, that combination is great. But if you don't have the time to process it, that's like, it's you're just wasting your you're just, you're, you know, It's going to be, you know, same old thing, looking for different results, you know, the definition of stupidity. And, uh, and I was guilty of that for decades. You know, so I think we all are. So yeah, yeah. so that time off, I mean, of course, all that time off isn't meant to, focus on the business, that's probably where it starts, you know, so take some time off. Um, and I, even for me, at one point in time, I, I went to my wife and said, I'd like to do this like like two days a year. I'm going to check into a hotel like that Thursday night in my town. I'm going to spend Thursday night there. I'm going to spend the next day there, get a late checkout, and then I'm going to come home. And then I want you to do the same thing so you don't feel like I'll take care of the kids. So you can you, you can go off with your buddies, get a girlfriend or whatever. Do whatever <laughs> you so it's not like all about me. Um, and whether she takes me up on that or not, but that offer is sincere. But that, even that, you know, like you don't have to, it's not a, you know, a, a, a home vacation or a staycation or whatever people call it, but it kind of is because you don't have to leave town. Just get yourself out of the office and out of the house. So go to NBC Suites or Hilton or Motel 6, wherever you want to, someplace where you can be by yourself. And, uh, and that, that's that's a really simple solution for any of us. Any, anybody can do that. It says, well, I don't have time for an airplane and this, this, this. Like, Get your car, drive five miles, and you'll be in a totally different place. If you write yourself. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I love that. And um, you know, basically, once an entrepreneur learns how to sever sever the relationship between time and money, basically, you're making money, you know, independent of your time. And then you talk about how you can 
leverage office revenue into maximum wealth accumulation. This is kind of talking about your earned income and then putting it into safe investments. Kind of talk about that because a lot of doctors, they basically make a bunch of money and then they buy fancy houses, cars, vacations. And you know, by the time they're 70, they have nothing. So kind of talk about that. Yeah, I love that topic. Uh, and actually, the first book I wrote is called uh, Fancy or 4M40. Uh, you can have it all. You just can't have it all now. So <laughs> it, it's that exact same thing, you know, and, and I think there's such a trap. Uh, and that's really my word that, you know, as a, as a young professional, especially medical, you know, your, your buddies, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure about your path, but I had a lot of good buddies in college. So some of them went, some of them around to masters, some of them just plain like went jumped into investment banking and things like that. So ran out of college, they were they were earning money, and and for me, you know, four years, and then for, you know, physicians at least two, four more years after that, and especially another four years. So you got you know six years after college, eight years after college, or more, where you're you're earning enough to get by, maybe still accumulating student debt. So compared to your buddies, like your debt's way up here. And while you're while you're creating more debt, they're creating income, and their income path is is a, you know four five six years ahead of yours. And then you get out and you think like, well, I should have what my high, my college but You still have that pressure like, of that. Uh, and I think maybe the worst, you know, uh, Dr. Lou, is that like society looks at it and says, well, Dr. Lou, you're 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 an MD, you're a PhD MD. Like you should be living in that house. You should be driving that car. And your kids should be going to that school. And like, there's all this. Like, what's wrong with you? You must be a failure if you aren't doing those things. So it's kind of that self-worth thing. I want to do these things that my buddies are. And then society is saying, like, you should. And, and then maybe, of, of course, the credit industry says, yeah, you, you, you should be using this little card and buying this stuff for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go do that. <laughs> but you know, when, you, when you just look at the math of that compounding you know, debt against you or compounding you know, revenue, investment, savings for you, and you look at those graphs, it's just how scary... Uh, how amazing it is, maybe it's the right word, when you start early and just, you know, and let that just naturally rise. And somewhere around like 15, 20 years, that graph just starts to like just take off on its own. But it takes that long to really do it, you know? And it, it doesn't matter how much you're putting in, but it's more start early. And to me, you know, like it seems like it's it's so simple, but it's not easy. If you look, if you remember back to your, you know, your, your college and then, and then, uh, professional, any sort of post-college post education, whatever that is, be it be aware of that path, and you look at how you're living, unless you were somehow financed by your parents or a spouse that's working and doing very, very well, you're kind of living on the cheap, like, because you haven't got a lot of money, and you're okay with it. Like, that's a joy that. Even if you grew up in a fancy house and all this other stuff, you're still like, hey, this is all I got. So somehow we go from that mentality to, and I'm just, and in that book, I'm just suggesting, like, well, just give yourself a little bit of fancy stuff. Just give yourself a little bit of luxury. Just kind of like ease it in there as long as you're just siphoning money off. And, and the siphoning part, part for me should be, like, just make it. It's not a big decision. Just decide, like, one decision once, which is I'm going to take you know, this much money. It's going to go right out of my business, into an account, and I don't ever touch it. And I never have to make write a check. I don't do any of that. It just goes away, and I don't touch it. So it's not a lot. Of, it's not like every week you have to say, "Okay, I have to write this check to myself again." And then to, like, no, it's and it's gone. So, and and the folks that do that, like exactly to your point, you know, come. So the four and four is is how do you get four million dollars in an investment account at age forty? So you do that, and then you know it's hard to know like how much money you think you need, you know, at retirement or what retirement is and so forth. No, but you do that and you just let it sit there and at age 62, 65, you got 23, 4, 5, 6 million just sitting in that account. And, you know, for most folks, that's enough. You know, you can have a pretty good lifestyle when you're debt free with, with uh, 25 million sitting in an account. You know? uh, but if you don't start it when you're young, oh, it's so painful and hard to do it later on. And for, to your point, it never happens. You know, you're, you're 62, 65, 66, 70, 72, and how come you're still working? And the real reason is because I have to. You know, everything falls apart if I don't. It's so sad. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite it's quite interesting. You know, once you realize, you know, kind of because you're aging your health and is kind of on the decline. And then basically to keep up with inflation and you know, taxes, you know, and all this um volatility, you have to let your money work for you. And you know, compound is like the strongest force. 
And, you know, the more you start saving, the, the earlier you get in, the faster, you know, the more critical mass, um, which is so key for doctors. Um, yeah, it's quite interesting because, you know, um, it's uh, in 2008, you know, it was you could get a car loan, but they wouldn't give you a, a loan to buy a house. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, you see where the uh, industry is, their incentives are aligned to get you in the consumer debt. So so kind of talk about um, this idea of, um, so kind of team and building a great culture, leadership, kind of talk about, you know, those ideas. Yeah, sure. Well, so, you know, again, on all this stuff, you know, Dr. Guru, I'm going to just be the messenger. Like, I, I don't think I ever had. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 to my credit, I maybe had one original idea that that's, <laughs> that was mine. You know, I'm, I'm just a just a good enough student to say, let's look at ideas and let's see what seems to work. Um, and 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 I'll qualify all that by saying, you know, that of course leadership is learned. For some people, maybe can, it's easier for them to learn than others, than other people. But it's it's a learned thing. Nobody is born being an amazingly great leader. Uh, certainly has nothing to do with personality. That big charisma is like that can even be a liability sometimes. You know, to in a leadership role. Um, so if to folks that are listening and say, yeah, I just haven't got what you got. It's like, yeah, you have everything that I got for sure. I can tell you. And one thing about me, certainly even to this day is I'm not a big fan of confrontation. I got, I got a better run away, uh, than, than, than by confrontation of those, those feeling like difficult conversations that you might have with, uh, an employee say. Um, so for me that uh, putting in a, a structure into the small business, which really kind of started at the top. You know, which is is like what what is the purpose of this business? Like in in, in a sense, the last you now. So for us, it was you know essentially what we were doing was was changing people's lives, and so our mantra became you know change, changing people's lives one smile at a time. So everything we looked at and said like, it, it, are we truly changing somebody's life this way? And smile is just a generic kind of type thing. You know, like we're smiling, we're smiling. Everybody's everybody's there's joy in what we're doing. Um, so that was kind of that thing. So everything gets bounced off of that. And right underneath that was when we're hiring and looking at things at the individual level, uh, are our, you know, our beliefs and uh, the, the virtues that people have to have on this team. So this is, this is who the individuals are. And then the third thing, uh, third layer was really like an organizational board or accountability chart or something like that, which is kind of like, so this is everybody, this is all the positions in the office. Here's the positions, and then whose name are we going to put next to that position? So therefore, they're in charge, and do they accept responsibility for that? And that's a, that's a verbal yes, I do. I have the ability. I understand what I need to do, and I want that position. Okay, good. Um, so at that point, at least when things didn't work out, then then I wasn't the bad guy or the good guy. I was more just a quality control person that could just kind of look at who we are and say, so that stuff that happened yesterday. Let's just look at this from the standpoint point of when we are at our best. Like we as a, as a unit are functioning at our best and are really focused on our purpose of changing people's lives. But it's what happened yesterday to fit into that the best we can be. And usually if I'm going to bring that up, it's because it doesn't. But at the same point, that allows everybody to look at that and say, yeah, no, no, that is. Okay, good, fine. So how do we change that so it doesn't happen again? Because it will, you know, left hand someone will happen again. How do we change that as a team? Like, what do we do differently? What does that look like? What do we have to change systems? Do we have to change this? What does that look like? So that's as a group we could look at that. And then if somebody was doing something that I looked at and said, I just don't feel that fit, then at least I could say, you know, we talked here about like being like, say, like lifelong learners. Like that's who we're committed to. That's who we are. We keep learning. And we had this thing yesterday, and it was obvious that you didn't read the part of the book and you even said that you're supposed to. So help me understand how that action fits in with a lifelong learner. This is who I am as part of this team. Because I'm sure it does in some way, but I can't see it. Explain that to you. And it was a true sense of like, like I caught you and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to beat you up. There's more like, you're a great, you're a great employee. I know you are. That's why you're here. You're working hard, but I see a disconnect and I want you to explain to me why it's not a disconnect. And if there was, if it might be, well, here's what was going on. Here's this, this, like, that's great. Now I understand. Perfect. Okay, good. Or it might be like, well, you know, blah, 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 excuse, 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 but I know, you know, excuses are worthwhile. You're right. I just need, I get, I'll get, I won't let it happen again back to you. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then if something gets dropped in the office, just look at it and say, okay, good. So like, the, you know, the, the X, Y, Z didn't happen. Who's in charge of that? Well, there's the chart. There's the position. There's the name. You are. And so how come it didn't happen? Right? Mm -hmm. and, and we talk about that once a week. We just look at things. Okay, here's this, this. Who's in charge? What's going on? But all that kind of stuff. So for me, you know, the idea of leadership, that one is, is that I think, I think that every employee, I like to think this at least, we love to work in a place that has a mission that's bigger than that. 
I bring yeah. love to being in a place like this place is, is, is doing things that totally align with who I am and doing it in a really big way that you never do on it. So they really want to be there for that reason. It's not all about the money or stuff. That's the main reason. And I truly believe that, that everybody wants to have that. Not yeah. everybody, but most everybody is just not in the right place, the right spot. Yeah. Um, and so once you have the right people, you're hiring those right people, then that other part of it, they look at and just say, because there are some people are just like, yeah, you know, I, I just don't want to do it anymore. Awesome. That's cool. Like, we'll help you find some place that doesn't care whether you do or not. And we'll find somebody to take your place here that does care. Um, but it became much less confrontational and having that hierarchy in there, people like the real, uh, the, like the Michael Jordans that you want on your team, they could kind of look at that and say, so in this environment, I know exactly what I need to do to be a rock star. If I do this, this, and this amazingly well, then I'm going to be killing. And, and, and I think the Michael Jordans of the world love that, as opposed to, I could do everything right, and I'd have no clue, one, if I'm doing it right or doing it not, or somebody say, well, that was your job. No, it was your job. I did it yesterday. Well, all that kind of stuff. It's like, that just kind of helps get rid of that. A lot of rock stars would be amazing. Yeah. How can people contact you, uh, follow you on social media, check out your book, uh, reach out to you, et cetera? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, at my website, I'm, I'm really transparent, very easy to find, Dr. Lou. Uh, website is uh, it's a little bit different. So the website name of the company is Ultimate Success in Dentistry. That's my coaching business. Uh, the website is ultimatesuccess.dentist. Uh, that book I talked about with the 4M40. Also, you can go to 4M40.com. But this is a link that brings it, brings it back in, which for some folks is easier to remember. Uh, and then, uh, you know, basically on there, you can find me through their uh, LinkedIn, you know, YouTube channels, Facebook, so like all those sites are right on there. You can easily find those. And, and the weekly vlogs on uh, YouTube are always interesting on leadership and business development. So uh, a couple of book offers on there for folks that, that check it out. So, yeah, lots of good stuff. Yeah, and awesome. I, and then the first published book uh, called Peak Success, uh, An Entrepreneurial Guide to Prosperity, uh, well, is available on Amazon maybe even like tomorrow, 13th of November. It's, it's official launch date on Amazon. So that's available as well. Nice. And for all the audience out there, let's thank um, Jeff for coming on and really talking about really entrepreneurship. Uh, all of David's resources will be in the links and show notes. Um, and uh, be sure to check out his book on Amazon. Check it out. Leave a great review. Follow him on all his socials. And with that, thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Bethany. Thank you. Appreciate all you're doing for uh, for the rest of us out here to, to make our days easier. It's great. Awesome.